a very low price point. So uh, they've got a couple of models out, but the cheapest one I think is about 60 US dollars. So, you know, compared to, I don't know, what you pay for a desktop GPU, you know, orders of magnitude cheaper. And this has really allowed a lot of people to experiment with these things in places they probably wouldn't have done otherwise. So let's get straight to where am I using it. So uh, I'm, I'm running Home Assistant in my home. Uh, I'm not going to assume you're too familiar with this, but uh, it's a home automation uh, platform written in Python, and it's all open source. And so I've got a couple of camera feeds uh, in my home assistant. And this actually here is a screenshot of what uh, my object detection has seen outside uh, the street in my house. So, uh, okay, so let me show you a bit more information there. So basically I wrote um, sort of a plugin for Home Assistant that connects to another project which I've been working on called DeepStack. And that allows Home Assistant to use DeepStack as the engine for doing object detection. So basically, yeah, you create um, an integration Home Assistant so that it's capturing frames from video cameras around the home uh, processing those with ZeepStack and presenting the results in Home Assistant. So this is just a, a sort of screenshot of uh, the information that DeepStack uh, has found in, in that particular image. Uh, basically, you give it a list of things you care about, a list of objects, uh, confidence thresh thresholds, and it processes the, the frames coming off the camera. And when it detects uh, targets that meet the criteria that you set, it will then uh, give a running tally of the, of the number of targets that is found. And uh, what I originally used this one for is uh, to find out when there was parking spot free outside my house, because uh, we've got you know quite a busy street, and if you weren't able to park outside your house, you might have to walk for a long time to uh, to find the spot. And uh, so I created, I set up uh, DeepStack to look at the spot outside my house and tell me if it was free. So if my car was down the road, I could bring it and put it outside the house. So um, that's what I, one of the things I was doing with it originally. Uh, the other thing I've been doing with it, and you can't see anybody there now, but uh, I can show you some shots of what it does. But basically, I've got a motion-activated uh, camera at my front door. And uh, you know how you have those ring doorbells, which uh, basically, you know, somebody pushes the button and it takes a photo and it sends sends that to uh, the owner of the home, I thought, well, it'd be much more fun to create one that you don't even have to push the button and it does it automatically. Um, so the first iteration of that was basically uh, a motion triggered camera. But the thing about that is you get lots of uh, false positives. You know, somebody walking by in the street would set it off. So that's really what started me down the journey of trying to get object detection running in a home. And now the way it works is it's still a motion triggered camera at the door. But now, actually, each frame that it's, it's captured is sent to uh, the DeepStack engine. And then if it finds a person in the frame, then it will send me a notification. So uh, it's kind of like a ring, but with uh, added AI brains and uh, without all the fees, et cetera, that go with that. So those are the two things I've been using it for. So I have curiosity, have you got any other Home Assistant users here or anybody else uh, familiar with DeepStack? Unfortunately, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I know it's just a matter of time, Francesco. It is. <laughs> it is, fantastic. Um, so, yeah, that's how I'm using it uh, in my home. Uh, this is running on a Jetson Nano that's sitting uh, in my living room and connected to the router. Uh, we can go a bit more technical on that. Uh, or the other option is to cover some cover one of the other projects I've been working on, which is using a Raspberry Pi that uh, I'm assuming maybe a few more people own a Raspberry Pi than they do a Jetson Nano, but um, it might create quite a good sort of talking point um, about sort of practicalities of deploying uh, object detection, you know, in the home or at the edge. So have we got any Raspberry Pi users around? Um, I, I am I am one of them. Okay, fantastic. You got one. It's very it's so quiet when you're talking to yourself. It's a little bit weird. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I see you're still there. And still we we are here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I also went to start experiment with Raspberry Pi and, and Jetson Nano, but 
not there yet, but I, I do want to get there. I have a, a bunch of Raspberry Pis, but uh, yeah, so that'd be interesting. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, Raspberry Pi is one of those computers that, you know, everyone's got like a couple sitting in a drawer and they're like, what on earth can I do with that? Two suggestions, you can put Home Assistant on one of them and the other thing you can do is uh, do object detection or face detection in the home with uh, Raspberry Pi. It actually works reasonably well. Uh, you're kind of limited by the memory on a Raspberry Pi. I think that when I was doing this before, there was like one gigabyte and you'd have a situation where if you loaded up a model uh, you know, a face detection model or something, you might get like one inference off it before it would then crash saying, I haven't got enough RAM. So this was always a bit of a pain point with the Raspberry Pis until quite recently. Uh, two things happened uh, more recently. So they released a, a newer version of the Raspberry Pi, which is the Raspberry Pi 4, which really bumped uh, the memory available on, on the Raspberry Pi. So now I think you can get up to eight gigabyte RAM on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so the uh, the model um, loading wouldn't be an issue now. Uh, the other thing that happened is Google got um, got got into the Edge AI game, and they released a range of products uh, under this Coral brand. Let me just show you that because it's pretty cool, actually. Google Coral, here we go. And I guess this is Google's. Um, platform to put edge uh, AI at the edge. Uh, and so what they've done is they've released um, TPUs that are low cost and uh, can be integrated into products or can be run standalone uh, on a, sort of either a USB stick kind of device, which is the one that I own, or they have their own single board computers that have this TPU on there as well. And uh, they've, this is actually a really interesting site to have a look at because they, they um, have a few companies that are using this uh, TPU Coral product uh, in sort of some really interesting applications uh, around like uh, detecting, uh, I think uh, there's some around like detecting if people are wearing PPE, you know, protective equipment in the COVID situation or uh, looking at safety stuff. Um, and along with the they, hardware, they've got this, sorry, yeah. Rob, Rob. Uh, just, just a quick question, please. Like, do they have also GPUs or only TPUs? So TPU is their take on the GPU. So okay. I mean, right. I, I think it's like highly optimized to run TensorFlow, basically. Got it. Uh, Got it. Hence the, hence the name. So um, we can get into the whole uh, Google versus others uh, conversation at the end, but it does. If you're thinking about getting into edge AI and practical deployment. Um, you know, that, that might be something you need to consider up front. Do you want to be in the, the Google universe or in the PyTorch Facebook universe? Or is there some <clears throat> path you can go in the middle? Right. So, yeah, just, just to recap, um, my yeah, my first project was with the Raspberry Pi because I had a few lying around. And I was like, okay, let's see what kind of AI we can do with a $40, $40 single board computer. Uh, yeah, so my initial efforts with the Raspberry Pi 3 were very, like, underwhelming. Stuff would crash. You'd maybe get a couple of frames, and, you know, then something would hang. But the release of this kind of uh, dedicated hardware really changed the, the possibilities for the Edge AI, uh, particularly, you know, in the home or, you know, you've got small throughput, basically, on uh, low-cost computers. <clears throat> so, yeah, if you're interested in uh, Google's sort of take on Edge AI, definitely check out the, the Coral uh, platform. This is hardware. They've also got a whole model zoo that, that is available. Uh, these are TensorFlow Lite models. So, basically, these are TensorFlow models that have been trimmed down to uh, operate on, you know, low resource devices like mobile phones or Raspberry Pi or these Coral devices. Uh, and they have, uh, yeah, some, some nice models that will, you know, do basic stuff. So they've got like an object detection model, uh, pose estimation, they can do segmentation. Uh, it's not just vision, they can also do audio stuff. Um, so definitely check out that website. But, uh, let me go back to the project. So th this is my first experiment in the home. So Raspberry Pi, this is actually Raspberry Pi 3 with uh, the Coral. And basically the way it works is that I had a Raspberry Pi camera, it would capture a frame, 
uh, you then basically send the image over to this Coral device. It does the inferencing on that device and then would return uh, the results uh, to a program running on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, what this particular project uh, was doing was putting a REST API uh, in front of uh, that backend um, so that you could uh, then use this Raspberry Pi uh, with any other project that you've got. And uh, what I actually did was end up uh, implementing the same endpoints that uh, DeepStack uh, currently implements. So basically by adopting like a you know microservices approach where you put everything in a little behind a, an API, the well-defined spec, you can end up creating um, more, you know, a bunch of products on, or tools on top of that. So that's definitely something that has been a bit of a game changer in terms of uh, making sort of edge AI much more practical and something you can use in other tools like Home Assistant or um, other like security things people are doing around home. Um, so do people want me to talk more about um, the application or are people interested in hearing about the code side of stuff or do people want to hear about, um, I don't know, custom models? Yeah, I'm curious to see how the code side of, of this work. Like how do you communicate with the Coral? Uh, device like do you have like Python code running there? Uh, yeah, so and, yeah, uh, and I'm curious about Jetson as well. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will get to Jetson. It's uh, I figure this is like you know the kind of baby steps before we get to that that stuff. Um, so yeah, basically yeah, Python. I mean, this is the sort of language that all I guess like well at least the data scientists that I speak to are using. Uh, people are training uh, models with Python, so it seems only natural to uh, use Python to um, enable people to use those models as well. And uh, so th this is the, the source code for that Coral Pi device. And basically, you import the hardware um, as an engine, and then what you will see later on, I just don't remember how it works, <laughs> uh, they provide you with, uh, Google provide you with an API. So literally, this abstracts away all that hardware. You literally, uh, I think that's right at the beginning. So this is a flask app. Um, um, this is running on the Raspberry Pi with that Coral device plugged in. So literally, I think it's really simple. It must be a main at the beginning. So. Right. So let's see. So, all right, okay, so the way I set it up was that you'd tell it which model you want to use. You can have a directory of models, like a folder of models, and it would load one of those in. Um, and this is the line that creates the connection with the hardware. So this, this is, you get access to that, that TPU on that, on that <clears throat> running on that Coral stick, and from a developer perspective, all you have to do is import this, uh, this class here. So yeah, the way this works is we've got a little flask app and it's just exposing an endpoint uh, on a particular port and using curl or requests or whatever your preferred tool is, you post an image uh, to the endpoint and uh, it basically will just pass out the, the, the bytes from that image, pass them to the coral stick, uh, returning an array of predictions and then there's just a bit more code that formats uh, those predictions into a, a JSON uh, payload that the, that's then just returned by the API. So the way I was using this actually was as a, a drop-in replacement for DeepStack, uh, which at the time was closed source and didn't run on the Jetson. So that's originally was my motivation for uh, sort of abstracting um, interactions with the TensorFlow uh, light model in this way. So is that a useful introduction to how from a practical point of view, you can you can deploy uh, an edge AI model. Then? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yep. The question that I have here is: the model that you're using is some model that they provide, or you train the model and then you're using it here? So, uh, both. Uh, so this is my first project, right? Okay. And at some point, when the Raspberry Pi four came out, you don't need this coral anymore because the Raspberry Pi 4 actually is a pretty capable device of its own. So I archived this project because what I found in practice was this whole need to connect it with the USB. Uh, I don't know, sometimes it would just like lose connection. 
Um, and the other thing I wanted to do was to wrap everything up in a Docker container so that uh, you wouldn't even have to worry about your environment and the thing. And I found that actually getting this kind of hardware interface to work with Docker was going to be a bit of a pain. Uh, so I ended up archiving this particular project and then moving uh, to another implementation. Just before Again, we go very quickly, very light models. Can, like, is the inference times that you have on Coral uh, better than what you have on the Raspberry Pi 4? I imagine yes, right? Uh, I think they're pretty comparable. Okay. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I think I did some benchmarking. But, I mean, for my practical uses, there wasn't enough of a benefit from the inputs in time. Like, if it's 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, it doesn't make any difference if you're only doing one frame a second anyway. It's like, I see. It's, it's good enough. So, for me, it was like, okay, I can shed some of the burden of having to maintain that support for that particular hardware um, and sacrifice a bit of performance. Um, so, that's what I chose to do in this case. So the right. next situation of the project was basically exactly the same code, but without importing uh, the hardware, not using that, that Coral Pi stick. Uh, the benefit here is uh, it kind of simplified um, the sort of deployment, because like I say, what I really wanted to do was actually put it in a Docker container, so that rather than having to, you know, from a user's point of view, think, okay, I have to set up a virtual environment, uh, you know, make sure my hardware is in such a way, Instead, all you actually have to do in this case is just Docker run uh, and you know do your port mapping and away you went. So that was the sort of next stage uh, along, and you know by implementing uh, an endpoint with exactly the same, uh, well exactly the same endpoint, accepting the same arguments and returning the same formatted data, I could just swap out <coughs> you know, the first project for the second project. So this is great because I had everything set up for this to already work with Home Assistant. So that's how I got to uh, the second iteration of this. Um, yeah, okay. And this is a bit of benchmarking I did comparing both um, my MacBook Pro with the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, and also looking at two different uh, frameworks for actually serving up the model Flask and Fast API. And uh, you can see that uh, Raspberry Pi, this is, I think, processing like a dozen images, was about, it was taking about two or three times longer than a MacBook Pro, which, which isn't bad, um, I think. So to come back to the model, so, okay, let me show you the model zoo, right? So this is, there's a whole zoo of TensorFlow Lite models that um, Google maintained for you. I think it shows them here, but they have a, some really interesting stuff in there. They've got um, dog segmentation. <laughs> you never know when that could be useful. <laughs> uh, face detection. I'm pretty sure that. Has. So okay, so that's it. That's an image. But they do face detection. Uh, they've got various um, kind of iterations of uh, some of the very common models. Inception v3. That's the classification. Um, and uh, mobile net. I think that's basic object detection. And uh, they have some interesting ones, particularly uh, for, like detecting particular kind of animals. So I think they had like a bird's model and some other kind of animal related model. But to come back to your question about uh, teaching them, did I teach, train my own models uh, in TensorFlow Lite? The answer is yes. And Google actually did quite, uh, I think, quite a nice job of making that very easy to get going so has anybody seen the teachable machine before yes nope no i didn't as well no nope. we've, we've got one or two people there that have seen it which is great and it's basically like a web GUI where you can upload images um from yeah from your local machine or from the google drive and create classification models in the browser well obviously it's, you know, actually it might even be in the browser i'm not sure because tensorflow light there's a the flavor of it that actually I think is in JavaScript and can run in your browser. But anyway, so basically it's like a visual GUI where you, you upload your images, I think like, you know, a folder of cats, a folder of dogs. Uh, that's right, yeah. So they give you a box for class one, a box for class two. So you put 100 cats, 100 dogs, uh, select, okay. No, that's not any idea, but you can select the kind of model that you want to train. And then at the end, they have like an export button, and this allows you to export your train model in a variety of formats. You know, optimized for the Edge TPU, um, optimized, I think, like Android phone. They give you a couple of different options. But 
This is the tool that actually I used to create a very simple cats and dog dog classification model, just for the fun of it. Um, and yeah, because what I discovered is actually a classification model, they do have quite a lot of use cases, uh, practical use cases, you know. So oftentimes, somebody just wants to know, is there a car on the driveway or not? Uh, is there somebody at the door or not? And actually, in those cases, you can probably get away with a classification model, uh, which you know is pretty they're pretty easy for uh, somebody without a lot of experience to train. You just need a folder of you know each of the classes that you care about. Use a tool like that Teachable machine. Uh, it generates a little binary file that actually is the model, uh, and then uh, you could use something like this uh, to expose that model in the standardized format. Uh, behind uh, an API like this. So that's uh, where I got to with uh, the Raspberry Pi. Um, any other questions about that before we move on? Not on my side. Yeah, I think I'm okay as well. Okay, fantastic. So, okay, we're, we're leaving Raspberry Pi and TensorFlow Lite land behind. And I mean, my where I came to with this was it works. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, but the models are a little bit limited. So you can have pretty good classification models You're going on the you know, accuracy benchmarks. But I was really interested in doing object detection. I wanted to count objects. And what I found was that the mobile net models and the other TensorFlow Lite models that were supported by the Coral hardware, they were lacking the accuracy that, that I wanted. So that's why I ended up um, leaving, leaving those behind. So kind of a useful... Uh, stepping stone to where we're at now. And uh, where we're at now is uh, this project called DeepStack, which is by uh, John. John, I won't even try to pronounce his name, Olaf Fenwa. And uh, I'm not sure if he's on the call now. He said he might be, but uh, this is something that he's been working on. He was working on it in a private repo for a couple of years. And what this allowed you to, uh, does allow you to do is to expose uh, a variety of computer vision uh, AI models uh, via a very standardized uh, API. So a RESTful API, uh, actually implementing exactly the same endpoints as the one I used for my uh, Coral project. And all of that using Docker to abstract away uh, the actual software. So regardless if you're on a Mac or a Windows or Linux or even a Raspberry Pi, you could just say Docker run, deep stack, and then just tell it what endpoints you wanted to expose. So the, the most recent change in uh, around Christmas last, this last year uh, was that he open sourced, open sourced uh, deep stack. Prior to this, it was closed source. And they had uh, like a free tier <coughs> and uh, a charged here, which was you know enabling like extra features like support for GPU and um, there were some other limitations, but now everything's open source and uh, hoping to get lots of uh, lots more contributors to this uh, to this library. Okay, so here we go. So it's had 3.2 million pulls on Docker Hub. So I think that attests to the popularity of uh, DeepStack. Um, yeah. I'll let you in your own time check out uh, the docs, but I think this gives you a little bit of an overview of um, the uh, models exposed by DeepStack. What's that doing? <sighs> okay, good. So one's like the sort of developer website, and that's taking a little while to load. And the other one is the sort of consumer uh, manager's website, you know, where it shows uh, what could you actually do with DeepStack. Okay, so they describe it as an AI server for the edge, which exposes yeah, face detection model, face recognition, object detection, including custom objects, uh, scene recognition, recognition, so classification. Oh, and uh, yeah, custom, custom object detection. And uh, that's actually a picture that I, that I generated <coughs> with a custom model that uh, is trained to detect if somebody's wearing a mask or not. So I'll jump back onto the DeepStack side. So what what is DeepStack? So basically, there's uh, a Go Go server that sits at the front. Uh, Go was selected because it's uh, ideal for this kind of application where you uh, <clears throat> you know need a very fast response to requests, 
Uh, so basically, this Go server, which exposes various endpoints for your face detection, uh, object detection. Uh, when requests come in, those get put onto a, a Redis queue. So, uh, uh, yeah, well, that's what it is, basically, a queue. And then in the background, you have uh, Python, which is actually accepting the data of, uh, putting the data off the Redis queue. So requests for processing images uh, and using PyTorch to uh, <clears throat> run the image through uh, any one of the models that's uh, available to DeepStack. Uh, and then that data is then returned by the Go API. Uh, the way it's set up is again using Docker, and basically we're supporting a, a couple of different platforms, but including the Jetson Nano, which I showed you before. So well, those are the build commands. But basically, the way it works is regardless of which of those platforms—Windows, Linux, uh, or a Jetson that you're on—you can use the same Docker run commands to bring up the end, the API running on that device. Uh, which you can then integrate, you know, with Home Assistant or any of the other tools that are out there that can uh, work with the with the endpoints. <clears throat> so around DeepStack, there's a small ecosystem of uh, sort of other tools that that work with DeepStack. Uh, I'm responsible for a fair few of them, but they're starting to pick up other contributors as well. So within Home Assistant, we've got support for object detection, face detection, scene detection. Uh, Created a little U, UI for DeepStack using uh, Streamlit. Um, uh, has anybody else used Streamlit before? Oh yes, yes. I have used Streamlit. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it's a really nice sort of way to build interactive dashboards, and so I created one in Streamlit for DeepStack, and it allows you to upload, you know, images. They then get processed by uh, which you can select between the object detection or base detection models, and it allows you to explore the results. <clears throat> and this is kind of where it gets a bit more interesting in terms of the practical application of uh, object detection models. So to show you uh, the scene outside of my house right now, which is, this is what DeepStack uh, found out there. I was finding that it was, this is at night, um, I discovered that it, there were several vehicles that I always seemed to find to classify correctly as cars, and several others, these two over here, that it was not ever picking up as a car. And I was like, why on earth is that? They definitely look like cars. So I put this this image through the um, deep stack UI, and it turns out that it's always classifying these two cars as suitcases, <laughs> very reliably classifying them as suitcases of high confidence. <laughs> so I ended up going back to my uh, my my um, <clears throat> configuration for this and saying, okay, well, let's also include suitcases in uh, the, the class of objects that we look for. And hey, presto, it's now reliably finding those two vehicles. So this is kind of like showing you some of the edge cases that you can experience um, when you put these models uh, into practice. <clears throat> so that, that's, that's where the UI came in because I didn't really understand why I was not finding those vehicles until I put everything through uh, a UI where you can go in and tweak the parameters that you're using to uh, interpret the data that DeepStack is uh, returning to you. So just to move on briefly to custom models, and how are they supported in DeepStack? So DeepStack is uh, for its object detection such as using YOLO 5, the YOLO V5 which um, sounds a bit like YOLO 4 and YOLO 3 and all the other ones, but um, it's, uh, it was released, I think, like sometime last year, and uh, there was a bit, of, um, a bit of controversy about it owing to the naming, and uh, it seems like pretty much anybody can create a YOLO model and name it what they want these days, but um, this, this uh, turned out to be quite a popular implementation. Where is it gone? Are you looking for the Ultralytrix implementation? Oh, that's it, yeah, Ultralytrix. Yeah. It kind of gives you a good idea of why tools like DeepStack need to exist. Where is it gone? Hmm. Try on Google. I think, I think you had it there. Uh, when you typed YOLO5, there was, there was Ultralytrix. Really? 
Yeah, Should I think it was there. Place. There we go. This, isn't that the um, second one? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, YOLO 5, I mean, originally DeepStack was using YOLO 3. It was using YOLO 3 for a long time. Uh, YOLO 5 came along and it offered not just like, <clears throat> I think like a small improvement in performance in terms of inferencing time, but uh, no, actually there's a small improvement in accuracy, but a big improvement in inferencing time. So previously, like, uh, we had a benchmarking script and uh, I think with YOLO 3, if you wanted to process like, 20 images on the hardware I was using, it would take like 10 seconds. And then in YOLO 5, it went down to like one second. It was some really order of magnitude uh, improvement. Wow. In, uh, the speed. And uh, I think they've got like uh, quite in detail technical write up on why that's the case. I think this is actually like a consultancy that created it, <clears throat> presumably around uh, making a business on creating custom models using YOLO 5. Uh, but just to, yeah, so under the hood, DeepStack is using Yellow 5 models. And uh, in fact, the trend, if you look at Ultralytics, they include the sort of standard thing of like a really long uh, Python script with lots of you know, quite uh, specific uh, you know, uh, requirements for how the data needs to be annotated. Which is where ice fishing comes in because you know it standardizes all of that and makes it a lot easier. But if you if we didn't have that, you uh, you have to approach something like this if you want to get started with uh, training a custom model and uh, well, yeah, I guess even deploying it like a very long script. So how we're doing it in DeepStack is we've just created um, it's actually using that original script, but it's a slightly modified version of it. So that all the user has to do is prepare their data um, using in the I think it's the uh, it's the YOLO format. So this is um, text. I think it's a text file or a JSON file per image. Um, and then we have uh, a Jupyter notebook which you can run on Google Colab, um, which you then you, yeah you basically just upload your annotated images. Uh, and run the notebook, and it will at the end generate um, the model file, the, the .pt PyTorch model file. And then, if you want to uh, deploy that with DeepStack, it's literally just an extra um, argument in the Docker run command to show to point to the location of the the volume where you put that uh, that model. So that's that's how custom models are trained and deployed. Uh, with deep stack, that's the wrong notebook actually. Um, okay, there's another notebook in there somewhere. So we've got custom objects. So this is the documentation for it. Um, describes how you can annotate the data using label. Let me pronounce that label image. And then uh, links to the uh, notebook where you can uh, train train uh, your own custom model, your annotated data set. And then all you have to do is download that locally, put it on the machine where you're running DeepStack, uh, restart DeepStack, mounting in the volume where that model is, and it will automatically generate uh, an endpoint for that model. Um, so from a user's perspective, we were trying to come up with the, the sort of, you know, the simplest way of doing it. What's going on here? So that basically concludes uh, the presentation for DeepStack. Uh, I guess at this point, I'll open it up for discussions and questions. Yeah. I know some people had some questions on the forums before. Hmm. I don't know if that person is here uh, though. I, I have you, like uh, I have a, a a question around like uh, the integration with the Jetson, right? The Jetson Nano. Uh, yeah. So, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, the performance at inference time, uh, I'm not, you know, like you have a camera which has, you know, records a stream of of, of video at 30 
frames per second or something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, right? But then uh, how, how does it work? Like, you know, you're not, of course, you're not processing 30 images every second, right? Uh, you're probably sampling. Uh, and, you know, at, at what point, like, you know, the Jetson is not going to respond anymore? You know, have you, have you done any tests on that? Um, what is the so maximum you can push your, your, your device? There was some pretty well thorough articles on benchmarking of, you know, performance of standard models on Jetson. Turns out like benchmarking is quite a difficult thing to do in a really fair way. You know, for example, if you're comparing like a uh, Coral TPU with uh, some, you know, PyTorch running on uh, Jetson, how, how would you even compare those two because they're running completely different models? Um, and there's always some extra, you know, effects from like how you actually interface with those models if you're going via an API or if you're using a dedicated script, you know. So actually benchmarking is quite a sort of challenging topic in itself. So what I would encourage you to do there is just to, to uh, look for one of those articles that was written on that topic. Uh, coming back to your question about what is what is practical and when is a Jetson no longer practical. So 30 frames per second, there's not many things that move quickly enough that they're going to change much between one frame and the next. Yeah. Uh, the, the obvious example of a use case where that is uh, important is like a, a self-driving vehicle. Well, obviously, you're on the road, you're driving along 30 frames per second, you actually need to process every single one of those frames. Uh, for the applications that I'm doing, like detecting somebody at the door, like I could, I could get away with like, you know, even if I wanted to continually process that stream, even one frame per second is going to pick up somebody at the door before they've had mm -hmm. a chance to push push the doorbell. So you might say, okay, well, one frame a second, I'll use the Raspberry Pi then. But the advantage with the Jetson is you can actually load these uh, much larger uh, models, YOLO 5, for example, uh, and get the more high accuracy, which, uh, from my experience, is one of the most crucial factors because uh, you know, there's nothing more infuriating than uh, getting like a dozen notifications for something that's not there. So in practice, uh, I tended towards the Jetson because of the higher accuracy of the models that are available. Uh, the other thing that the Jetson gives you is bandwidth. So you could potentially um, process like, uh, you know, there's obviously trade-offs here, but you could process multiple camera camera feeds, let's say, uh, you know, 10 frames per second, uh, just using the Jetson. And they have this whole uh, software stack just around uh, taking frames off the camera stream and uh, putting them through uh, an optimized model. Right. So hopefully that answers. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. It does. It does. And and you know, like as a follow up question here. So have you have you tried um, deploying models on Jetson without DeepStack? Uh, so like running plain PyTorch or TensorFlow or or whatever you've tried. Um, Right. Yeah, literally I mean, having um, a script there which runs, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, so what I mean, Jetson, obviously, uh, NVIDIA, they, they published um, like a whole uh, sort of stack, like a stack of uh, Jupyter notebooks, which allow you to do everything from like running basic inferencing to doing some like stuff with video feeds um, to doing like, you know, a specific kind of models like uh, key point detection. Um, so if you if you just want to get stuck in, you're not interested in deep stack. You just want to get stuck in and uh, run models. They they provide a really nice uh, suite of material to get to get you started on that. I uh, did the obligatory thing of like you know connecting a webcam up and you know, waving at it and working through the notebooks and whatnot. Um, but for my use cases, like the, the models that deep stack was exposing. Uh, just a sort of standard uh, vanilla object detection model with 80 classes in it was okay for my practical applications. And uh, I mostly put my effort into uh, sort of crafting the integration with Home Assistant because uh, uh, when we when I started this like a year and a half ago, I didn't know how how should object detection work in the home. You know, what do people care about? And uh, you know. When the, the first implementation, the first release, uh, every object was, uh, you had a single confidence threshold, for every object. But what you find is that, hey, the model has a much stronger bias towards detecting people, but I need a different confidence, confidence threshold to detect, say, a bus outside my house. So the, the next iteration of the integration was allowing 
uh, you know, a confidence per class. Uh, and then, you know, further refinements are about, okay, where in an image is something happening? And another refinement might be, okay, day or night, I, do I need different uh, thresholds uh, to detect what I care about? So that actually has kept me very busy to the point where I haven't uh, actually experimented too much with different kinds of models on the Jetson. But uh, just to come back to what I said at the beginning, there's there's a whole bunch of uh, literature out there just to, to help mm -hmm. you get started. And it's really approachable, actually. Yeah, just to add to that conversation, um, Jetson comes with um, Ubuntu 18.04. So, so you literally can do anything you can do in Ubuntu in Jetson, although it's, it's on an ARM processor. And uh, so it comes with OpenCV compiled for ARM processor. Actually, it comes with installed OpenCV 4.1. And uh, so you can literally run a PyTorch model um, or install TensorFlow or install Docker. Um, uh, or what they really want you to do is to use TensorRT. So it comes with TensorRT, which is NVIDIA's inference engine. So you can, uh, and they provide you a good way to convert a PyTorch model into a TensorRT model, which actually goes through Onyx. So PyTorch to Onyx, Onyx to TensorRT. Uh, you could do the same thing for TensorFlow as well, um, which which, I, which they claim is the, is the fastest way to run um, more deep learning models on, on Jetson. But you can certainly run uh, vanilla TensorFlow or, or PyTorch or, or, or Onyx directly on Jetson as well. Um, when when we looked at it, um, it, it was better than Raspberry Pi be, only because only because it just comes pre-installed. You know, it's basically Ubuntu, right? So it's, so it's no it's seamless inference from your development environment to the deployment system, um, and not a different OS uh, completely. Uh, the only caveat is that uh, like this old Jetson is is owned by you know, NVIDIA, so it's not complete 100% open source, uh, but it is still a um, very useful platform uh, to do a lot of things. Yeah. We were able to do detect uh, like um, uh, water bubbles at 8 FPS, and, and that was good enough uh, for us. Uh, but I think you can, I think they do claim that you can go up to 30 FPS uh, if you use TensorRT, uh, and if you really want to get extra speed, if you can even write a C++ engine, then you can get the extra speed, but we didn't want to take the additional overhead. So we just stuck with Python, um, and then we're happy with the ETFP. So anyway. Have you wow, tried? Awesome. Yeah, 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 Jetson is definitely, and if you Jetson Nano is not a choice, um, you can also upgrade to Jetson uh, Xavier. So Jetson Nano is like $99, but if you add chargers and SD card, you come to $150. And then, uh, Jetson Xavier is the next, uh, basically all, the only the differences is really in the, the amount of memory uh, that is there. So Jetson Xavier, I think it is a eight or 16 GB. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. There are two versions of it. I think it's more close for $400 or $299. I'm not sure now. But um, yeah, so those are additional things you might consider if you want to use it. As a, as a hobby versus professional, if, you, if it's hobby, then I think Nano is good enough. But if you want it slightly, if you wanted the additional memory, then you can certainly upgrade, you know, to 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 the next version in the in the Jetson um, platform, which is the Xavier uh, version, which is which comes in eight and sixteen GB, which which is plenty uh, for most tasks for, from an inference point of view. Did you try converting a PyTorch model to TensorRT? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, we, I did a lot. It's, it's very straightforward, super simple, primarily because PyTorch uh, fully supports Onyx. Uh, so so you can go PyTorch to Onyx, Onyx TensorRT, really, really straightforward. TensorFlow is much more challenging because TensorFlow doesn't want to work with the Onyx ecosystem by in general. So they uh, it's more challenging to get TensorFlow to convert to TensorRT, but that also converts, but it's slightly more challenging, particularly when you use like certain TensorFlow operations that don't automatically convert. But PyTorch is very, very straightforward. In fact, all all of NVIDIA. I see. I see. Uh, you try that with uh, with object detection model or classification? Uh, we tried with Retina Net object detection model. Huh, interesting. Uh, we, and yeah, we did we, we even converted Retina Net from a TensorFlow as well 
to to tensor RT. That yeah. also converts. And it's you, just that you, you cannot do NMS. We were not able to do NMS in in the in the conversion, so we have to do NMS in NumPy and not in the not in the tensor RT graph. But otherwise, the core piece of it converts. I see. I see. And you like this retina net model that you're talking about is the official one for Torch Vision. Are you another one that we implement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's basically the, the open source vanilla one. It's not, not nothing. You know, that, that is honestly, there is no no customization. Just straight straight the you know whatever is a basic tensor, basic pyramid structure. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Have you tried faster SNN or mask SNN as well, or no? No, I've not tried any of that. Um, uh, mostly because the retina net itself gave us what we needed. So we I have not see. done any other architecture uh, exploration in that regard. Um, uh, but yeah, but uh, but I think yeah, definitely when you do these things, start with the classification model because that actually gets you the infrastructure piece of it out of the way, and then you can go into object detection piece because classification is straight. Uh, you know, it's very straightforward uh, to convert those models. I see. And then, and then you can iterate on it and and build that. Put some other model into it, like like uh, any other object detection model. I see, I see. Because we were trying to convert to OnXS, especially Francesco, and then we were having some problems with mask, right, Francesco? Yeah, it was it was mask or CNN. So I tried with faster CNN and Retina Net, and it worked pretty pretty okay. Uh, actually, it worked perfectly. But uh, only with a batch size of one, right? Sorry. Only with a batch size of one. Uh. Yeah, okay, yes, absolutely. That was another issue. That's another issue, yeah. The other issue is that dynamic access doesn't really work, uh, at least as far as I can tell, uh, in Torch Fusion. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you guys have any, you know, a different experience, but uh, yes, so that is, that is kind of a, li a limitation, so that, um, you know, I could just I could just feed a batch of one. Uh, but uh, for Mascar CNN actually didn't work. So what I mean is that um, the... Um, um, you know, like I, I, I had like the original Torch Vision model, Mascar CNN, and then like I converted that to Onyx, and that you know worked. Uh, and then when I started, when I tried inference on both the original PyTorch model and uh, the uh, uh, the Onyx one, uh, I got different masks, right? So PyTorch PyTorch model was returning different masks compared to Onyx. And I don't know why, and <laughs> nobody nobody knows why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of a different story. I I dropped it for the moment um, because I I got a little bit frustrated. But um, I'm gonna get back there one day. <laughs> yeah, one day. <laughs> I actually had another question for for Rob, if I may. Um, yeah, that, go ahead. Yeah. So so uh, that's deep stack. Um, support classification as well uh, like plain and simple image classification uh, we do it's it's not custom uh, classification models just yet just custom object detection models but there is um, there is a scene detection uh, model in yeah there. yeah okay because yeah so I was looking at that uh, and, and I was wondering if um, if the, if you had custom um, image classification but that that's not the case for the time being is that is that correct well, not unless you want to make a pull request. I mean, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, that's a very good. That's a very good answer. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like I say, like classification models. You kind of think, oh, that's that's cats and dogs. I don't need that. But actually, there's lots of practical applications where that's good enough. And it's like Sam said, you know, you first see you, you kind of prove the principle with that, and you might find that actually that solves the problem that you're, you're working on awfully well. Yeah, because you know, I, I was thinking about damage damage detection, right? And, and in in some cases, I don't I don't really need like to. Um, I mean, of course, like object object detection is is is, um, is probably like more um, suited for for damage detection because you you might want to know where the damage is, like in in the picture. But in some cases, you just want to know if within the picture there is damage, right? Um, and yeah. just, for example, like stop like a line, like a, a production line, right? You want to stop a production line because because you know that there is something wrong in that frame, right? And so uh, that's a lot easier, right? You just have like a bunch of pictures with damage, a bunch of picture, uh, a bunch of pictures without damage, and then you just run a binary classification, right? Um, and so that's yeah, why I was, I'm was guessing that they, in practice they have like maybe an ensemble of models like all looking for different kind of features and then you just give the confidence of for each one of mm -hmm. those like 
seventy-four percent scratch, thirty-two percent dent, something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Those mm-hmm. models are particularly easier to train as well. So, yep, yep. No, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was looking into deep stacks specifically, just you know, for the specific question because I, ah, I, okay. I love, like, I love the the the, the Docker um, um, abstraction, right? So that it, it's it's supported by default, and um, and so I, I, I wanted to know um, if that was supported. But uh, yeah, I guess that you know a PR is always welcomed, so <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> Rob, I have questions. The about the uh, the Docker image, the mm-hmm. the, the DeepStack uh, Docker image. I guess it's uh, built on top of the uh, Jetson uh, Docker image, and then they add their uh, the models. Or uh, I think uh, yeah, I mean um, it's like a base image for Deep uh, DeepStack, and then uh, a couple of other images, hardware specific. Uh, for the Jetson hardware, and I think the models as well. So uh, earlier on, Sam was talking about the Tensor RT optimization. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't done that yet for the Jetson models, but uh, just just from reading about it, we, you know, we think we're going to get a factor of two improvement in the inferencing time uh, just by doing the, that using that Tensor RT. <coughs> and mm-hmm. you can even get a bit more specific, so you can optimize for particular flavors of the Jetson hardware. So you've got the Jetson Nano, which uh, if you use that as a benchmark, then there's the Jetson Xavier, which is a more capable machine. Uh, just just from reading uh, a few articles about it, it seemed like a model you can get double the performance on the Xavier, uh, but only once you've done the Tensor RT optimization. Because I actually own both of those two bits of hardware right now. They both run at exactly the same time. But it shows you there's still margin, definitely margin, uh, to be gained by optimizing for that particular piece of hardware. So that that's on the roadmap for deep stack, and we want to get to the point where you know you can uh, say I, I want to run the the mask detection model, and it will automatically select the model which has been optimized for your hardware uh, to give you the best possible performance. So that's where we want to get uh, with that. Okay. And I have a question. And, sorry. Go ahead, please. Um, j- so uh, about the uh, do you throttle the image that you feed your uh, your model or what, what do you do? It's the application that takes care, like uh, in order not to get the the, the three uh, FPS. Um, so do we throttle what the frames that are being processed by these back? Is that a question? Yes, because I guess you you're not going to bombard the. Uh, your uh, your Jetson with the uh, 30 FPS. Do you I mean, select like so yeah, one so image every? I don't know. For, for example, so there's, uh, there's there's two two layer two ways you can go with uh, with this, right? So DeepStack uses Redis, which is basically just a queue. So if you hit it with more and more requests, it would just add those to the queue. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Uh, but the option, the other approach, which is what I did in my um, with my Raspberry Pi and the Coral stuff. You don't have a queue. You just sit there. You just hope that, okay, I'm not going to hit it more than it can handle. And uh, so with Home Assistant's integration, right, Home Assistant, it's not it's not a video processing piece of software. It's a home automation platform that has, like, some uh, video capability. But at, at most, it does one frame per second on Home Assistant. You can't. Okay. You does, it's not for video, right? Uh, so you're never, in fact, it's going to hit deep stack particularly hard using uh, Home Assistant. Um, some people, some other people have done projects where they've written code that will do like, you know, five or six frames per second. Um, you know, people that want to track moving things, uh, they typically need to do that. Um, deep stack should be able to scale to the point that the hardware can handle it. And there's definitely a lot of room for optimizations and improvements, uh, under the hood there as well. So. Uh, we, we had a couple of guys from NVIDIA reach out and say, hey, do something that's really cool. Um, we want to learn more about it. So we're hoping that over time it will, it will gather momentum. And uh, the fact that it makes it very user-friendly to get started with the hardware and the models will, will draw more people uh, to the project. Um, but if you just want to do something really simple, uh, you know, create an endpoint, and you're not going to hit it particularly hard, you can just use Flask or Fast API, you know, mm-hmm. half a dozen lines of code. Uh, to abstract that away and put it behind an endpoint that you can then use in practical applications. You know, it doesn't need to be uh, too complicated. Cool. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, have, I had a follow-up question there actually. So, so the deep stack is running as, as a Docker container, and it can take in images, right? And then yeah. you have you have a separate application that is um, capturing the feed from the camera, and then is, is it writing to a file, and then you put the file name into the latest queue, or, or what is how does this process go when you communicate between these two independent processes that is running? So, I mean, you literally just take the image, convert that to a byte, you know, a stream of bytes, uh, and post that as a string, basically. So there's, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, Home Assistant isn't saving a bunch of files in the background. Um, it's actually just directly pulling the, uh, the pixels out as bytes and posting those to DeepStack. Uh, one of the things the, home, the integration that I created does is it then, once you've uh, detected something in your image, it will save that as a JPEG locally and put the bounding boxes on it, which is actually what is displayed uh, on the front end that I showed you. So okay. um, there's no need to actually save any files at all. You can do everything uh, in memory. Okay, gotcha. So that saving of the file with the bounding box is done by the Home Assistant plugin, or, or is it in the DeepStack itself? DeepStack just returns you the returns you the coordinates of the bounding boxes, right? That's correct. Yeah. So the Home Assistant is it takes all that data and it says, okay, let's combine that with uh, the image data, and you, I think we're just using Pillow to draw some some boxes on it. It's not particularly uh, sophisticated or anything, but it works. And uh, okay, so that, that's how you see that display. I mean, going forward, we want to think about how do we uh, improve the way Home Assistant works with AI and sort of object detection models and computer vision models. Uh, because like Home Assistant is used to well, automate people's homes and it has a concept of like a homeowner and people, that kind of thing. But, you know, it'd be really nice in the future to tie it all together so that Home Assistant would say, hey, I've spotted Robin on the camera um, coming up uh, the driveway or, you know, turn on the lights, something like that. So. There's lots of scope for improvement. It's still really early days um, in terms of the actual integration into real you know, daily life, I think. Interesting. So, 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 so just on the other side of the Redis um, queue, is it, still, is it your Flask application that reads the queue and then calls the, calls the DeepStack API, or is DeepStack reading the Redis queue? Uh, so there's a little Go server, and... Uh, I don't, I don't know any Go, but I think basically the way it works is uh, it spins up a few processes, um, and these Python uh, processes just sit there checking the reader's queue. I think it happens like every 0.1 of a second or something like that. So there's definitely, we had a suggestion about how to improve that, so you can turn that from a polling into more of a kind of triggered, uh, triggered uh, approach. Uh, but yeah, basically this Go server is orchestrating everything uh, in the background. Okay. Is it the uh, the home assistant that uh, uh, <clears throat> subscribe to the uh, or uh, push to the Redis or? So home assistant uh, is uh, is just we're just using re the request library in Python to okay. post uh, the image data to DeepStack via its uh, RESTful endpoints. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's really simple stuff like. DeepStack provides the abstraction. All you need is Docker run. Hey, I've got a REST API available. And the home system is, you know, uh, just patching into that via, you know, using the request library. I mean, you can use curl. Or... Okay. <clears throat> there's other sort of approaches out there as well. I think there's like RPC queues. I don't know if anybody knows about that, but it's a, a level that's even more low level than uh, HTTP requests. That is, I think, faster and uh, some of the other tools out there use that approach. Okay, so it's just home, home assistant that is posting the request there, and then from there, DeepStack will take care of the, uh, put it That's in right. uh, so, Redis, and then there's uh, like another process that takes That's care right. of reading the, uh, the the Redis and and then process the uh, image by image, and then return That's it. it to yeah okay there's a really there's a really nice article um mm -hmm. i don't know do you know that blog pie image search block pie no yep yeah, 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 yeah. Something other. Ad mm -hmm. adrian rosenbrock 
Yeah, he had a, a guest article uh, with the, the guy that wrote Keras, that Francois guy. And they, they showed you how to make a simple uh, REST API for exposing, I think, a, a TensorFlow classification model. Uh, that's a kind mm-hmm. of nice intro. That's originally, you know, that is like the original article on how to create a REST API for a machine learning model. There was a follow-up article to that where they actually say, well, how do you scale this to a, a more of a production system? And there they actually show you how you can use Redis and uh, uh, some uh, some other tools to you know, add that scaling capability to it. So that's a really good introduction to the topic of how do you make something you know more production ready. So definitely check it out. Mm-hmm. So like the, there is a parallel if you want to have like an, an enterpri- enterprise uh, grade solution because uh, I see that they use a uh, cube flow from. Uh, Kubernetes and and I guess <coughs> Kubernetes. I think they they use Kafka or. Uh, sorry, what are you talking about? No, we're not talking about uh, deep stuff. We're talking about something else. I'm I'm trying just to see the parallel between, uh, for example, the solution that you have with deep stack using Redis, uh-huh. and the solution oh, yeah. that are used like in uh, industry grade. You know, solution using Kubernetes and you know in the cloud, yeah. and because you have the they push a lot with the Cube Flow mm-hmm. from uh, Google, uh, so Kubernetes and and I, I don't remember. I I have the impression that there they use uh, Kafka, but it's the yeah. same principle. You know, it's, yeah. like, so it's always the same principle. Put put your request yeah. on the queue. Something else. Pick yes. them up. Uh, if you need more capacity, you just spin up more blah blah blah, whatever's. Um, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I've also done a bit of work with the AWS services. So they've got a service called Recognition, which does scene and object detection, and uh, it kind mm-hmm. of works in a similar way from the outside as DeepStack. You just got you know REST API, you just post it the bytes, and you know what not comes back. Um, I actually found when I looked at I compared DeepStack with uh, recognition like a year ago, and my kind of very uh, sort of basic experimentation. I had the impression that DeepStack was more more accurate and faster, right? Because you don't have to post it over the internet. Oh. <laughs> you know, DeepStack is is connected to my router. This is no latency there whatsoever. Uh, over time, actually, recognition seems to have got better and better. Uh, presumably, they're improving their hardware. I know that AWS have their own like. Tensor hardware now, and uh, the model definitely has improved in accuracy uh, quite a lot as well. So uh, it'd be quite nice, obviously, to have a, a local and open source uh, alternative to recognition. And I think that's what we're hoping to achieve with uh, DeepStack. Mm-hmm. Have you tried TorchServe as well? TorchServe, yeah. I mean, from a user's perspective, like you look at a tool like TorchServe, and I think it's like one for TensorFlow as well, and you immediately come up against like a wall of, okay, here's the YAML you're going to need. Like, they always make it easy to do like the basic hello well, but then when you say, okay, I want to put like custom object detection model, it's like, right, here's like a 300 page readme, and uh, you're going to need to know YAML and Kubernetes. DeepStack just made it all into a Docker run command, which I think is why it is really popular. I see, I see. Yeah, I, I think the way that Tarch Surf is, is moving, the last time I, I, I tried to play around with it, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, you just need to provide like uh, the weights for, for a model, uh, especially for the Torch Vision models, they have support for that. And then you just like run Tarch Surf command, and then it also just exposes an API, a REST API, I think, for you to, to interact yeah. with. Yeah, I think I think you know this is the way it's going, isn't it? I mean, DeepStack was not the first uh, AI in a Docker container service. There was one I was using before that called uh, Facebox. Which huh. <coughs> is the same thing there. She ended, that was a startup. Uh, two two or three guys based in the UK, and they ended up selling that to some uh, company that does like sports uh, streaming, and they all oh, got rich basically. <laughs> it seems to be a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> So D- DeepStack, they have their own uh, model zoo, from what I understand. So and that, that's the way we, we want to go, right? So if you go onto their, onto their docs site right now, 
So this is quite this is like the really cool thing about being involved in open source. I think you know we put it out there, does nothing happens for like a month, and everyone ignores it, and then some mm-hmm. random guy is like, yeah, I created a model to detect license license plates in Norway. I think it was Norway, and we're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and then you know he's, somebody else come along. Oh, I've done one uh, for I don't know mask detection. We're seeing uh, even today on Twitter, I saw some guy who, who's usually like making youtube videos about home automation he's like yeah i just trained a custom model and deployed it with deep stack i'm like really that's awesome cool. <laughs> it's like that people that don't cool. consider themselves like deep learning practitioners can create a model and get it you know put it in use in their home that i think that really is uh you know kind of a watershed moment yeah that's what agree. it is yeah. really cool it is really really cool it's and what is the the uh, business model of the deep stack How do they because now they are giving it for free you no know? at certain point they had like a, a private uh, yeah originally it was, um, it was like in a private repo that you know how to get into the docker container and uh, they had like a kind of an enterprise uh, offering so like there's a free tier where you could get like the models and um, I think you could train like five faces because you can do facial recognition and uh, Custom models were going to be like enterprise only, but actually both those guys got really plush jobs at Microsoft and they're like, hey, we don't need the money. So <laughs> they just opened <laughs> it everything. And uh, right now the business model is, well, this guy, John, is the main, he's the sort of core maintainer for it. Uh, we want to obviously bring more people uh, online and contributors to that. And uh, in terms of like the business model around it, how do you make that sustainable? I think the model here is kind of like a consultancy. Right, so an enterprise comes along and says, hey, I need a, a very specific kind of object detection model for, you know, damaged vehicles or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I see that you've got a way to deploy it. Can you can, can somebody create this model for me? Or, you know, uh, that's that's one way I see it uh, sort of being, you know, turned into a into a business, if you like. Um Uh, I think their vision really is to make a tool that is used by like the average developer to create mm-hmm. other products as well. So yeah, in terms of like how you monetize deep stack, I think yeah, sort of consultancy side, but um, yeah, to be confirmed. That makes sense. I mean you they they are developing like an expertise in to how to. deploy the different models and how to train yeah. them and how to de- deploy them exactly mm-hmm. and i think you know there's, there's big benefits i think like home assistant is quite a good example actually like the best quality software is software that's like developed out in the open and uh mm-hmm. to give home assistant as an example you know it started by one guy who was just like python script seven years ago and now it employs i think like six people full-time So you know it, it can it can evolve and uh, it picks up a lot of momentum. Uh, it, it can be a livelihood for people as well. Yes, Home Assistant they have their own product. Uh, from what I noticed in on their Twitter. <coughs> yeah, they just um, they just released. Uh, you can you can order for like one hundred and fifty dollars, I think, uh, single board computer. Uh, mm-hmm. It's pretty good specs actually, and everything's. Everything's on there. It's like almost like Apple TV kind of grade experience, like plug it into your router, use the app, set it up, and off you go. Um, I'm not sure they actually – I don't think they actually make any money off that. Um, mm-hmm. They have uh, a cloud component. So actually, coming back to your rather question, how do you monetize this? You know, always, always the answer is, you know, a free tier and then something for the corporates. Um, yes. But to give Home Assistant an example, they've got – For five dollars a month, you can get um, an integration with their like cloud platform, which then actually enables you to access your home assistant uh, from anywhere in the world, right? Securely, uh, mm-hmm. you, you can do it manually, right? You have to set up like all these certificates and SSL stuff. Yeah, and I tried this, and I, you know, I think I'm reasonably technically competent, but I got fed up with it, and I was like, "Sod that!" And then they produce this <laughs> thing. I was like, five oh, dollars a month, yeah." That, That's worth it to know that something secure and somebody else taking care of it for you. So that that might be another way that you know DeepStack would go. Um, you know, we've got this implementation you can put on your hardware, and you know, 
anybody can use that. But if you want a fleet of like 500 devices, okay, now mm -hmm. you go to the corporate plan. Or if you want something that can like scale and push stuff onto uh, you know, AWS or whatever, uh, there might be a sort of an enterprise uh, angle on that. And I guess yeah. there there's a lot of competition there between different uh, the the manufacturers or uh, yeah, there's definitely providers an, an arm, and an arms race going on. Like you, you can feel it. You've got Intel, they've got their hardware. You've got Google, they've got their hardware. Yes, got, yes. Uh, obviously, Nvidia. I'm mm -hmm. sure there's other companies out there, and they just know that. In, in the same way that like smartphones are everywhere, I'm guessing GPUs or whatever will be everywhere in 10 years' time and they all want to be the, uh, yes. the bedrock for that. So you can feel it. I mean, for me personally, what would be a really good outcome of all of this is like NVIDIA come to us and say, hey, this is awesome. We want to pay you guys to go full-time on this, uh, change the world of it. I mean, that will be like a dream outcome from being involved in all this. Mm -hmm. so we shall see. You never know. <laughs> That's a very good option <laughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have we got any other any other questions, or I'll hand it back over to uh, one of you guys to uh, think there's something else we need to uh, talk about? Yeah, we have a question here that uh, let me let me check. So it is. Uh, oh, I had it. One second here. The Jay Artist asked uh, today at afternoon. He wants to know if the deployment between Jetson Nano and Javier uh, changes or is the same thing? So it's exactly the same thing, right? Um, it's actually the same even if you're on Windows or Linux. It's the same commands that you use with Docker. You know, uh, it's the developers that have done the legwork in the background to make it that kind of uh, seamless experience. <clears throat> I think we, we ideally want to keep it, keep it that way. But as I mentioned earlier on, uh, there's potential hardware specific optimizations we can do and um, you know it might be the case that at some point you would need to download a different model if you've got a Xavier or a Nano but right now if you're just using the vanilla models it's exactly the same I see thanks cool. yeah cool by, yes. the, by the way, I, I tried installing installing Torch Vision on Jetson today, and it was a bloodshed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to rant uselessly, and then I would go on mute. <laughs> I would go on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so you I, see, I didn't. I, fa I failed, by the way. So it's not installed yet. <laughs> uh, well, you could have installed Deepstack by now. I, I I know that's that I, I exactly I know I'm, I don't even know why I'm talking about torture vision at all. I should be <laughs> so so you see, Rob, there is a market there. Yeah, uh, there's a market of yeah. people suffering yeah. trying to install yeah. torture vision. Uh, there you, you go. You just listen for the swearing and you walk towards. Oh God, yes, you should have you should have been here. You should have been here. Yeah, I was. I've been there. Well. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, on on uh, Jetson, you use CUDA as well. I ask you to me because I don't know. I, I hate it. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone who knows the answer? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess if it comes from NVIDIA, you you expect that it's uh, CUDA compatible, no? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You do use CUDA. I think it's ten point one. I think. Uh, latest, okay. Uh, but uh -huh. it is shared memory, so it's not CUDA memory is not independent from main memory. It's a shared memory. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah. That's actually a benefit to that. Is because there is no memory transfer happening from your your RAM to to, to GPU RAM. It's basically the same memory block, Ooh. which actually is, is why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's somewhat faster. I don't know what the uh, trade-off is, uh, but uh, the shared memory is how, how they have built it. So when you are using like PyTorch, uh, the calls you, they normally do tensor.cpu or tensor.cuda. That doesn't do anything then. On, uh, on Jetson. Both yeah, are the same. Yeah, I say, I, I've not used PyTorch. I did use PyTorch directly. Yeah, I, because if you go to NVIDIA examples for, for Jet, uh, for, for Jetson, they have a Hello World examples. Uh -huh. And they do use vanilla PyTorch and actually Torch Vision as well uh, to capture the camera feed. Um, 
and I don't think you use any two CUDA in there. I'm not sure now. Uh, they have a notebook. I can try to find it and post it uh, on the chat chat here. Cool. Um, yeah, because I actually I, I just use Tensor RP. Really know um, how the uh, uh, you know whether to do CUDA or not in in PyTorch when you use JSON. But I I'm on to say you don't because there is no difference between there's no CPU and GPU difference in in, in Jetson. It's it's. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I, I can try to find out an example uh, of that notebook uh, that, that NVIDIA releases, released uh, and, and see if that helps. All right, thank so, you. So your mo motivation of using uh, Tensor RT is uh, a performance? Oh yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. it's, it's at least okay. at least three times faster. Three uh, times faster? Yeah, three times oh. faster than this. Oh, oh, oh. And, 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 and it also consumes less memory uh, compared, to, compared to both uh, TensorFlow is the worst of all because it consumes all the memory, a lot of memory, but in PyTorch also consumes a lot of memory uh, compared to TensorRT. TensorRT is not only fast, but also it consumes less memory is why it's uh, easier. Is, is it because they optimize the Onyx, uh, yes. uh, Onyx yes. file? Because the, the yeah, Onyx exactly. model? Yeah, okay. I, in a, not the Onyx model, but when you convert Onyx to TensorRT, you have some flags you can set. So, for example, okay. we we use FP16, uh, and then uh, okay, yeah. So there are some flags. I, 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 I don't mm. know. I, again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say that you can't get to the same performance if you use if you use you know PyTorch directly or TensorFlow directly. I'm, probably you could. Um, uh, -huh. uh It's it's just that it was only a couple of commands to convert it, and yes. you know, I was getting performance boost. So that's why we never looked back and said can we do the same thing with Penilla, uh, mm -hmm. basically you know directly with PyTorch or TensorFlow because that motivation was not there. So I guess they, they do it like transparently in the sense that they go and do all the optimization that you would do manually they they automate. automate somewhat the, yeah some, okay. yeah somewhat yeah, yeah that, that is a piece of software I, I don't know if TensorFlow but that's a piece of software you don't fully because it's mostly written in C, so it's really hard to go down and see what they really do there. Ah, oh, yeah, because it's closed there. Yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah. And also, you have to specify a batch size. So, so every every um, every uh, like uh, uh, forward propagation in the inference, we always used to give a specific batch size, whether it is batch of one or batch of eight or batch of four. You have to, you know, when you build the TensorRT um, engine or TensorRT, uh, you know. The, the weights file, you have mm -hmm. to specify what is the batch size because it allocates memory based on that. Uh, okay. Because it converts your 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 tensor 2D tensor or 3D tensor of inputs into actually a 1D memory block, and 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 so, so it needs to pre-allocate the memory block, um, and then it just copies any new data to that memory block. And those are the kind of optimizations they have done to make it faster instead of reallocating memory over and over again. Yeah, very nice. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? I think we're done here. All right. So thanks a lot, Rob, for yet another presentation. It was very, very cool. I'm very interested in this deployment in Thank edge you. devices. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, man. I yeah. really, really appreciate your time. So thanks a lot for sharing for sharing what you what you learned on the way. It's a really important.